now back to recording here. Share. That's mine. Uh, and yours was oh, oh, 9, 16 something. I yeah, know. the problem is they are all Coimbra something, you know. Yeah, but I, I <laughs> so, you, so you will all you will all have to help me. But the next speaker is uh, is Emana Emanuela Ransu from from PSI. Yeah. If if you stand over here, I think you will actually be visible. Do so I want that? Yeah, I guess. You should. You should. You should. Uh, I think does that work? Maybe it doesn't. I should. It Try should work. Yeah. It does. Yeah. So there's a pointer there and bouncing uh, back and forth. And the pointer is, is very soft. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So now we heard at the remote end. Do you hear us? Hello. 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 Maybe. Uh, Can you? Yes. Uh, yes, I hear you. You hear us? Yes. Okay. Then I won't bother. Uh, making uh, more adjustments to anything here. Here we are. So, Emanuela, take it away. Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the, of the, of the parts that PSI has in this Maxtas MCNP business. It goes back a, a couple of years, you know, um, where we are involved in uh, doing some sort of testing of the, of the coupled interface, the interface between the two, the two software. Um, uh, by trying to reproduce uh, or doing some experiments and then trying to reproduce with the uh, with the simulation the experiment and see that uh, yeah it works okay. Um, so we had done some initial testing back when the one of the uh, the winning candidates between the coupling was this uh, SSW SSR kind of uh, communication, and um, uh, back then our goal was to uh, you know, uh, find an experiment simply enough, at least uh, geometrically, so don't complicate it too much by, by, by having uh, weird surfaces and, 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 and weird components in there. Um, have some measurements, uh, take the, the, the code I, I took from Espen back then, um, um, reproduce the, the experiment, go uh, use MaxTAS and uh, MCNP, go back and forth between those two a few times with, uh, with the cards, written input, output. And see whether you get something reasonable. We're not testing the physics, obviously. Here, we're just testing that when you go back and forth, you don't lose information, or you don't um, uh, make x into z and uh, velocity into position, or whatever. Um, and we chose to uh, simulate an, an experiment that we're actually running at the moment. We were using, uh, we were testing some sapphire crystals that uh, were candidates as filters at the at the board beam line at PSI. And because it was just a very uh, linear kind of, uh, of, of uh, a sequence of, uh, of components uh, using the experiment, well, that's a very nice thing to, to test uh, with, with um, the software as well. It's easy to implement, very easy. Uh, so uh, we did that. Uh, oops. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what we uh, what we did was um, we used Maxtas to simulate the, the, the source and also the um, part of the bar beam line, the part of the beam line that is up just before the bump, right? Uh, anything that the user has no access to, the, the, uh, the, the guides, the benders, etc., just before uh, uh, the beam enters into the bar bump. So that was, uh, we used Maxtas for that. Then uh, we had sapphire filters uh, placed somewhere into the, uh, uh, the beam line in both. Um, that uh, again we simulated with access, but between the entrance of the neutrons into the bunker and the uh, sapphires, uh, we used uh, MCMP just to, to, to make sure we're not running into vacuum, just a silly kind of uh, MCMP uh, usage just to, to uh, simulate uh, neutrons traveling through air. Um, and after the sapphires, again, our neutrons go through air before they, uh, they hit a detector. So that was our, our very simple sequence of going from Maxas to MCNP a couple of times. Um, and um, so we had measurements for a variety of um, um, crystal thicknesses that are represented here um, different colors. 
uh, and we did those uh, those measurements that we, we had to do anyway, and then we reproduced them with this uh, Maxlas MCMP scheme that I, I showed earlier. And uh, here, on uh, dashed lines, you have the experiments, on the solid lines, you had the MCMP Maxlas sequence of, uh, uh, of uh, simulating that experience uh, experiment, and then we can, you know, very happy to see, yes, you know, going back and forth. You know, doing anything too crazy, actually, you know, reproducing or the code is working as it should. So that was in the past um, when when uh, this kind of, of development uh, had come out. Um, so with this current um, uh, work package, it had been discussed that uh, PSI will again try to do something like that. So we're going to have um, uh, a couple of uh, uh, measurements, two different types of measurements, experiments. And we're going to actually uh, do at the BOA uh, beam line again, and then use the current development, the current way of communicate of, of uh, uh, coupling between uh, Maxlas and MCMP, uh, simulate those and provide some sort of, uh, again, confirmation on um, success. Um, so for most of you know about BOA, but for those who don't, so uh, BOA is one of the beam lines at the uh, uh, SYNQ source of uh, PSI in Switzerland. It is a general purpose beam line, and that means that actually what you have is pretty much uh, an, an empty bunker. It's just filled with tables and stages that you can put whatever you desire, uh, and uh, it's mostly used for um, testing and developing either components for other beam lines or testing various ideas or, or, or making measurements that uh, you want to simulate, etc. Um, uh, it is very modular in the sense that, uh, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, it has a lot of motors and stages and you put on, on there whatever you want, uh, choppers, detectors, uh, samples, slits, uh, collimators, anything that your experiment requires. and uh, it has been widely used for developing and testing a lot of uh, uh, neutron optics components, uh, especially uh, neutron lenses, uh, simple lenses, uh, uh, adaptive, uh, semi-adaptive prior lenses, and, and so on and so forth. It is worth that. Um, and because BOR is used for those type of measurements, which are just testing and, and uh, um, testing ideas, uh, coming up with developments, etc., it requires that very often simulations need to be part of this to, to confirm uh, and compare um, either MCNP or MAXTAS. And for that purpose, um, we, we already have MCNP and MAXTAS um, codes that describe both the source and the guides and, uh, and the, 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 the whole component of core outside the bunker, but also inside the bunker. Um, we have both MAXTAS and MCNP models for those, and they have been tested in various uh, ways uh, uh, many times uh, for uh, many different purposes, many different experiments. So we're confident that you know we can describe anything that happens at BOA very accurately either with MCMP or with MAXTAS. Uh, one um, example that we had a very good agreement actually with, with uh, using MAXTAS to describe um, uh, the whole beam line and what, is, what was mounted in the beam line, and comparing the experiment and having a very, very nice agreement, was when we were doing some um, measurements uh, with um, um, neutron lenses, focusing and defocusing neutron lenses. So we had mounted on, on uh, and developing on board um, the concept of having a, a focus and defocus apparatus for neutrons. And because we had, um, some issues actually aligning those components. We used simulations to tell us how much we are misaligned, uh, so that we can go back into the, uh, the experimental setup and align the components correctly. And here I'm just showing um, uh, just some instances or some images that we took with a CCD camera at some position after we have after the um, uh, focusing and defocusing lenses were uh, placed onto the beam line. The upper line is simulations, and the, the lower line is experiment. Um, we we our, our code describes a uh, Maxas code uh, matches very nicely with what we were measuring 
in uh, the beam line. And this is just a 1D profile of such a, uh, an image like the previous ones where we are comparing simulation uh, uh, with experiment. Um, so for the, for the new type of uh, um, uh, testing that we want to do for the uh, new MaxTAS MCMP uh, coupling, um, those are just uh, ideas that we could use the two, those, those uh, two similar experiments I just mentioned uh, previously. Uh, again, uh, this type of measurements that we did with a sapphire crystal um, or with some other kind of uh, filter, because we, we tend to measure filters of blood uh, quite often, and they're very uh, simple in, in geometrically uh, in terms of um, how things are in the, the, the beam line. Um, or, and, because uh, uh, we, we talked about actually doing two tests with two different kinds of things that we do for, um, use it, something like the, the previous images that I, that I showed, uh, something with a focusing and defocusing uh, lens, or just one lens, where we will do this back and forth between MCMP and MaxTAS a few times uh, and trying to match our, our measurements, see that the code communicates nice back and forth. Um, <laughs> any suggestions in terms of uh, those type of, uh, especially from the people that are actually developing, if they have an idea that they would like to see that, you know, this is, oh, this would be a nice type of, uh, of measurements that you could do, and so I kept pushing them. I'm not pushing anything right now. Um, so, any suggestion, especially from the from the developing people, the developing uh, team, um, we we would gladly take, and we will accommodate that. Um, the, in terms of you, you had uh, Peter had given at some point a little um, uh, table with uh, with the deadlines for the various uh, uh, things when they can happen. Uh, if we need to take new measurements in order to compare, if we don't use what we already have and stuff. Um, then that will take place uh, Q3 to Q4 of 2017, the new measurements. Uh, the SYNQ source at PSI stays closed <coughs> from December to May. Right now it's dead, <laughs> but it will come up soon. Um, so uh, if any new measurements need to be taken for this purpose, uh, this is the time frame for that. The uh, allocation of time takes place February 2017. Every year the board meeting happens in the February of that year. So uh, if I have any requests for something that, uh, you know, uh, is an idea and, and, and you would like to see being measured and compared to, then before February 2017 would be a good idea uh, to, to tell us what you would like, because then I can, I can uh, request the, the time that is needed. Um, otherwise, if I am to use, I mean, I already have measurements, uh, a variety of measurements done with lenses and also with, uh, with various types of filters. Um, if, if those are to be used for the testing, then any time that uh, our, our code can come our way and it's, you guys can say, you know, test it, no, I can do with those. Um, what, ah, um, so th this is pretty much, th that concerns this, um, uh, this part of, of PSI's involvement in doing this uh, kind of uh, comparison with a, uh, of a new developed uh, code with uh, experiment. Um, there was a, a, a part that I walked on, you know, just much earlier, where we, I, was, I was implementing some changes in the existing SSR, SSW kind of stuff that I can either spend one slide now, and it's going to be mostly directed to Eric and Espen, the clients, <laughs> or I can, I can communicate that uh, just privately to, to, to Eric and not bother the rest of you with uh, code details. Okay. But it's up to you. We have uh, experts on, on annoyances of, of SSI, SSW. Here, so Excellent. Might, okay. Might there you go. It's not a problem. Yes. yes. <laughs> Okay, so um, when when I was uh, using the SSR SSWs to, to do this type of comparison before with the with the, the simulation and the and the and the experiments, uh, there were a little there were a few things that were annoying, but also they were indicating that 
unless you sit down and explain to somebody how to do it, they can't do it. Right? So, and for this is this the, 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 the visual input output are going to be obsolete, they already went to obsolete, but they might exist already anyway in some um, uh, version old of Maxstar. So, you know, you might as well have stuff a, a little bit improved in there. Um, what, I don't know why this happens to the end of the slide. It's an so, art, artifact of the, of the meeting software. Okay. Um, so, the, I, I, I have made various changes to all three relevant type of, of, of files that go for using SSR and SSW. This is the visual uh, MCPSS input, the output, and the subs module that had all the, the relevant kind of things in there. Um, one of the main uh, problems was that um, um, when, when, when writing out from MacStars to, to send towards MCMP, MacStars was reading the, the number of events from the initial input that was given to it that came from MCMP. Then MacStars was going through all those events one by one. It was doing whatever it is it was doing. The neutrons were meeting whatever they were meeting on their path. And then as a header on the output file, uh, there were fa it was fastly written that the number of events that you have is the one you started with, right? And then you pass that onto MCNP, and it sees a header with, uh, this is the number of events I'm expecting, but the list is shorter, because MacStars in the meanwhile absorbed some, scattered some, threw away some, whatever. Um, so now it has changed, and whatever, whatever MacStars actually, whatever goes into the trace, of MacStars, uh, whatever goes into the trace of the output, of the visual output, it is written in the header file for MCMP to, to take in. Right? So then the header and the list match. Um, what else was there? Uh, yeah, there was some, um, um, what was there? Yeah. Um, File files naming, you know, so you don't have to, to by yourself change, you know, how the file should be named. That is changed. The user can name whatever he wants or she. Um, some uh, other uh, nuisance uh, with with uh, with the P track, whether you want it there or not, you know, produce it or not. I mean, those are small and silly things, but they they are they are done. And then the the other the main thing that is still is to be done is to make the damn thing parallel the the, the substring. Right. Um, one is that that still needs to be done, and the other thing is that, um, as 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 Stuart was saying, MCNP needs to start from that. So when you can do the whole sequence starting with MCNP, but you cannot start from Axtas and do the whole thing because you are expected to have a header that MCMP then can read about the surfaces and everything. And right now, I, I have been using it in that way, where I go from MaxTAS to MCMP, but it's a hack, right? And it's, 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 it's fall, not false, but it's not, it's not real. So I, I want to find a more clever way to be able to start directly from MaxTAS and go. It may never be used by anybody else, but since I, I was doing that. So Improvements to existing code is always useful. Yeah, yeah. So, no, no matter no matter how big the audience, so, uh, it it will go into to future better solutions. Yes. So it's my so my just uh, commenting uh, immediately immediately here while we're discussing this. I, I suggest you simply put your patches on uh, on GitHub. Okay. So you, you just you just give us a pull request and okay. it, it'll be there. Yeah. When when you say hack, yeah, ninety nine percent of the time that's the general right idea. Is that hack something like um, do you actually explain what happened? Is it something like you just start a part of, from a source that is immediately SSW part and that basically starts off? No, it's much more silly. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so when, when, when you use the visual input on MaxStars to, uh, to input something that MCMP created, it does two things. It reads a header file, the header file. Uh, it get it stores that information so that then it can read it it can write it as a header file for the output of MaxStars, but it also reads then the list of events and passes them through MaxStars. Um, so um, 
what I do is that I already create that header file with MCMP beforehand, but I don't let Maxtas read the, the neutrons. I use my Maxtas source, right? So I only get the header information, but not the neutral information. And I use the source description in Maxtas that I have. So you can actually have visual input and a, a Maxtas source together, and the, the visual input will be ignored. And we'll use the Maxtar source and only keep the, the header information to write it down. Okay. So it's it's called it's called a win. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, comments or questions? Uh, be it local or remote. Let's see. So anyone? Yeah, Stuart, another one? Maybe, so, yeah, suggest. Uh, right. if, if, if we think back to, or go back to the last this slide, when you were changing the counts right. in MCMP and McStats, uh -huh. is that not supposed to be done by not changing the counts in MCMP, but changing the start point? Because MCMP maintains both things. It maintains the number of count number of tracks you're supposed to be doing and where we actually start. So what I'm changing, the end count is in, in max stats, not in MCMP. Okay. Right? So I I read um, uh, I read the input file that MCMP inherited to max stats. Um, I read uh, how many uh, particles are there could be expected, and then I tell my stars internally your end count is going to be that number. It used to be that so when you start a simulation in stars and you have uh, and you have the file from MCNP, uh, instead of opening uh, instead of knowing how many events are in before before you needed to know how many events were in the uh, input file. That you're giving to Maxtas, and then give some end count there. You don't need to do that anymore. You can give some any number that you want to Maxtas; it will still get the right number. Oh, you don't need you don't need to care what is in on the output file of MCMP. Maxtas will figure it out and will run with that number. And as a user, you don't need to care. That's nice. So, That's so that's what I mean. You you pass the correct end count into Maxtas. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any uh, any further things? Questions, comments? No, but I, I, yeah. I mean, no. So so even though uh, yeah, even, even though you can say in, in some sense because of the uh, emergence of MCPL and yeah. we are perhaps going in that direction, I I think that doesn't invalidate the stuff we've done. Okay. I think we, we we ought to get that in. Good. Yeah. For sure. Good to know. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Uh, any further comments or questions? Otherwise, I think uh, Phil should unmute uh, his microphone. Yep. Okay. Can Can you hear me? All right. It's not too loud. Okay. So good. Just, I'll just maximize. Uh, boom, boom, boom. So your slides are now on uh, on our screen here. Yeah. To try. Try pressing page up, page down. See if you. All right. Know. I'll try. Does the pointer move in the right place? You should be pointing at ILL now. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. More. Excellent. So, observant members of the audience will see that I am not at the ILL, and down here in the bottom left, this is very old slides. But there's not actually that much different right now for the the code. So I figured I'd use these old slides. Um, I'll try page down. Excellent. <clears throat> so. Um, let me know if you are in trouble uh, during during the talk, then I'll I'll, I'll go and, and page up and I'll call you. So yeah, okay. Work, okay. I think if people scroll, like people online are scrolling, the, it changes the um, presenter slides too. It moves everybody. It, it does. So, yeah. so, so uh, everybody else, uh, please keep your fingers to yourself. <laughs> So the the idea, the rationale behind this was we we were working on some simulations at the ILL and uh, as lots of you probably already know we were working with optimization algorithms at the time 
and um, these uh, require you to do a lot of simulations, maybe um, 3,000 uh, runs, 3,000 individual simulations to get the uh, result that you want. And they take a long time. Um, so uh, if I go try page down, that didn't work. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, this comes from the need for having, um, you start with uh, 100 iterations or more to converge, and then you have maybe 30 to 50 agents running on each iteration, so you end up with about 3,000 simulations. And at the time, basically, uh, you either had to use a, a cluster to do that, or something other than Monte Carlo. Um, I'll skip this, this is all really old. Uh, skip, skip, skip. Um, this is the problem. <clears throat> the bottleneck is SANS. Okay, so if you're running a high-resolution SAN simulation, uh, you're, you're throwing away most of your neutrons. And this is, well, it's the same for any resolution, uh, high-resolution experiment. So um, from uh, 100 million trajectories entering the guide, if I ran for uh, about 11 minutes, I had 74 trajectories hit the sample, which was a 12% error. And so if I wanted to optimize the instrument to within a 1% error bar, I needed to do seven, uh, 25 CPU hours. And to do a full optimization, this was then um, about 25 years, uh, 25 CPU years, which is why you needed to go to the cluster. Um, and at the same time, I was talking to Klaus Habicht in Berlin uh, while I was working there about maybe there's a different way to do these uh, simulations. <coughs> um, if you want to get this into a sensible amount of time, you uh, you want to have one minute for each um, each model run simulation, and uh, that would then give you about one week for the whole of the optimization. Um, of course, the 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 work was successful, and the speed gain is the, the difference between uh, a set a snail and the, the Saturn V rocket. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be having this presentation if it didn't work. And the inspiration for the solution comes from the movie industry, actually. Um, this is a, an old picture now. Um, year 2000, it's a Povre scene rendered using ray tracing. Um, and, you know, Toy Story and stuff is rendered in a similar way. Um, this is quite, um, again, computationally intensive work. And this, again, another old picture. This is Half-Life 2. Uh, you can, that's running at 60 frames per second. And the two are pretty good uh, representations of the, the 3D world. And so I, the way that I wanted to tackle this was to come up with something which is more like this uh, uh, raster-based approach for polygon rendering and use that for simulating bunches of neutron trajectories that are similar. <clears throat> so you group the trajectories into bunches and then, and then just treat the whole bunch as one unit in, um, and manipulate the coordinates of the of the group rather than each individual trajectory. Um, and when we say bunches, it means that we group the phase space regions so there's a linear relationship between the trajectories. And a convenient way to do that is with a simple reflectivity model. So you can see um, this is an M equals uh, three guide, I think, yeah. One, two, three, yeah, two, three and a bit. Um, there's, there's basically two corners um, at, uh, on this curve. Um, I know that if you go to higher M, you end up with like a big sag here in the middle. Uh, but for our purposes, this is a fairly good approximation just to turn it into a, a function with um, two discontinuities like this. <coughs> um, so now we just need to define boundaries in a distance divergence space and then um, do the division on a module by module basis in the same way that the test works. Uh, and then you have a, a beam transport system. So this is an example um, of, a, of a source. This is a side view of a neutron source, like a moderator here. And then this is the result. This is the, the entrance of the guide sits about there. And then this is the phase space that you have for that describes that, that beam in its entirety. You'll notice that the theta axis is the horizontal, and the y axis is the position in the vertical. So this is divergence here and, and position here. And the four boundaries correspond to the different, the four corners on this boundary correspond to the position, which is exactly the same as the, the height of the guide. And then this alpha angle is the, um, this uh, theta value here is the same as this alpha angle there. So you end up with this um, parallelogram. 
To move the beam, you just have to shear the parallelogram. <clears throat> so we take the corner points and we just shift them like this. And then you've transported all of your neutron beam that distance, depending on what the shear is. And this is, of course, in the small angle approximation. Um, so imagine then you over-illuminate a hole. Um, what you do to model the hole is simply clip off the top and the bottom of the uh, phase space. And likewise, for a collimator, you clip off in the horizontal direction the divergence. <clears throat> um, I should say then, the way that the, the code implementation that I wrote works is it just manipulates these triangles. You can see that here there are two triangles. We just need a way of dividing the triangles uh, that conserves the area properly and doesn't um, create any artifacts in the code, uh, in the model term. Um, if we wanted to uh, do a rotation, then you simply slide the phase space axis in the horizontal um, plane. And if you want to do a translation, you slide the whole phase space in the vertical plane. So these calculations are extremely fast. The, uh, the tricky part comes when you want to do some reflections in a guide mirror. <clears throat> so what you have to do there is allow the parallelogram to shear like you would. You transport the neutrons to the end of the guide. And then you figure out what happened during the reflection. So we take the bit that pokes out over the end and we flip it around in theta and then we flip it around in y. Um, and so this part of the phase space ends up coming around here. And it's as simple as that. It's, there's really nothing much to this. Um, and when you do this rotation now, just like you do in McStas and Vitesse, you have to work out what the statistical value of that triangle is. And you know that because of the reflectivity of the super mirror. So <clears throat> this is why I've marked on this graph m equals 1 here and then m equals 3. We also have to divide this triangle at m equals 1 in order to conserve that, uh, that phase space intensity. And then the, the weighting of the triangles is calculated in this way. You've got three points with different y values, different w values, sorry. Um, it's this 3D volume at the bottom here that you have to calculate in order to figure out what the statistical weight is of this triangle at the bottom. So the guide shapes that are supported, that were supported back here in 2009, we've got a straight guide, uh, a curved guide, which is the, implemented in the way that they're built with uh, straight sections with a, with a very small um, angle, a kink angle. Um, converging guides and diverging guides and then an arbitrary guide which combines some of these things up here. In the intervening years I managed to get together some um, conic section codes so I put down uh, elliptic guides and parabolic guides and hyperbolic uh, mirrors just for fun because um, it's all the same equations and those are now uh, implemented as well. Um, so here's a test. We have a source here on the left, an expanding um, tapered guide here and then a straight guide on the end. Um, this is a, a Vitesse simulation on the left of what the phase space looks like at this position here near this W2 symbol. Um, and you can see this Z shape and then this is the acceptance diagram that comes out of the uh, code. You can see the, the agreement is pretty good. Um, and just for fun you can see what the um, triangles look like when you, break, when you just draw the outlines rather than the shading. The difference is the speed. This took uh, 4.8 seconds and this took 48 milliseconds. Uh, the second test we did was on D22. Again, this is why I was working at the ILL. Um, this is the phase space in the horizontal plane, sorry, vertical plane um, on the uh, sample position at D22. Um, and this is the uh, acceptance diagram that you get from the uh, NADS code. And then the horizontal plane, it looks like this. You can start to see down here and here the losses that you get from curving. So the phase space is wider at the top than it is at the bottom. And that's the uh, NADS output um, modeling the same thing. Um, this is a, a projection then onto the position. So we're integrating over, over di divergence now. And you can see that these fluctuations at the top, which would have normally looked a bit like noise, are actually physical um, and so the, the, the spots are the Monte Carlo code and the, the solid line is the NADS uh, output. Um, and for, for the SANS run this was 55 milliseconds to, to do this calculation which is a significant um, step up from 24 hours. Uh, we tested it on WASP 
uh, this I think this instrument's almost built now, um, but at the time it was a purely theoretical model. So you can see Peter Wu and, uh, Peter Fouquet's uh, 3D models of the coils here, um, and this is the agreement between McStas, uh, which is this, um, this line here, and then Nads is the blue, and the agreement's pretty good. You have to calculate each point individually on uh, Nads because it's monochromatic calculation method. Uh, we tested it against the model of Talis, um, <clears throat> and this was the model done with uh, Simless here. That's the this, this curve, and then the Nads curve is the one on the inside. Um, if you're interested in coding, which most people are, it's it's written in C++. The most recent version is actually written in Java, but I wanted to go back to C++ now. Um, and the input file is a XML file, which just looks like this. It's human readable. Um, you can edit it with any text editor. Um, uh, I would have done a live demonstration, but I haven't got one. Uh, I did have one eight years ago, or however long it is. The the important thing to note is the limitations on this code, on this method. So each NADS calculation is monochromatic. So if you want to do a white beam, you have to loop and, and calculate several uh, wavelength positions. It works in a small angle approximation. So if you've got any big angles, it starts to break down. And it also assumes that the phase space in the vertical and horizontal planes, um, those phase spaces are independent. So if you have one of these funky twisted guides or these octagonal guides that people are starting to get interested in, uh, you can't use this method because it mixes those two phase spaces up. And I haven't figured out how to join them up yet. Um, so it, the other thing, if you have like a, a, a circular source, for example, or, or a circular aperture, you have to approximate that with a rectangular object of equal area. So that's another limitation caused by the fact that you have to f separate the phase space. Um, so there we go. Uh, at the time, I was paid by S3, and Ken Anderson was my boss, and Klaus Harbich and Leo Kussen contributed a lot to this um, talk. But of course, in the intervening years, um, I should also probably thank David Milner and John Copley at NIST because they were also involved in all of this. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> yep. Uh, thank you. So, questions, uh, comments? Here or there? Yes. So, uh, as I understood, uh, th this propagation is also. In, in one plane at the time, isn't that true? So, so you either do horizontal or vertical? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So it does. It, it, it runs in actually two threads. Of, uh, tries to do it fairly much in uh, in parallel. But if you're curving in one axis, that that curved axis is the one that takes the most time. Um, so the one the vertical thread finishes really quick, and then the horizontal thread is what takes the time. Okay. Yeah. So and, it also means then that if you wanted to use this, in the, if you wanted to merge this with some Monte Carlo code, um, you'd have to bear that in mind with how you how you treat the correlations between horizontal and vertical uh, when you generate the trajectories. So you also have to think a bit to to implement the rotating uh, guide at the MLZ, for instance. Um, which one is that? That's the twisted one in in Munich, is it? Is that the one you mean? I can't remember the instrument, but, but, but there's this, uh, yeah. yeah. The kind of rotation around the beam axis from guide element to the next. Yeah, it's, it's the, it's the uh, reflectometer. They take, um, I forget which way around it is, but they either take a, a letterbox shape to guide and twist it so that they make the reflectometer efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that you, you can't model, you couldn't model that guide at the moment with, uh, with this method, I think. Oh. And then uh, Stuart is approaching here. I have uh, two comments. Okay. The, 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 the aspect of the two dimensions can be dealt with by putting it into a proper clipper geometry algebra and using bivectors rather than standard vectors. And that deals with the XY problem and can be technically extended into infinity, but that gets a bit scary. So just stick to bivectors and you'll mm -hmm. be good. And the second is, what we really need to do is at some point, I mean, it's a more discussion to the, to the group, is when we do our variance reductions, although this isn't the answer, it's an extremely good intermediate step to say um, we will do that, in particular where we've got problems of streaming down guides 
or streaming down channels. It doesn't need to be a guide. It can be um, a duct where you put a bit of cable in, and now you've got a leak or, or something like that. And I don't see the problem. And I want to hijack. Someone should hijack the code and, and put it into our variants, particularly our uh, joint systems. Otherwise, yeah. Uh, that was a comment, but, the, the, but I think it, I, I'd love to see it extended into a, a proper clip of geometry, so into by that as minimum, you know, mm -hmm. someone's clever, the rest of us. <laughs> Excellent. Anyone else? Let me just check if... Uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> will, will he do that work? I, I guess not. <laughs> isn't it the other way around these days? It's the other way around, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I thought. Okay. So uh, thanks a lot for that, Bill. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Eric has another question uh, here. So um, is this stuff uh, code uh, available somehow to anyone but you? Um, yeah. I think I I did have a website running at one point, but nobody was really downloading it, so I just got bored of that website. And when I moved house, I took it offline anyway. So my the, I think at the moment it's it's in the NOSG repository at the ESS. Um, if it isn't, I'll stick it on there today. Um, the the Java version, and then I'll put the C version up there once I've put it um, up to date. I should I should also maybe apologize that the the word um, for this NADS was actually the recommendation I think of a non native English speaker referee we we wanted to call it ADS and uh, he objected um, because ADS is an acronym that's used by NASA and so he suggested NADS um, and that's how he got his name well you know <laughs> some of us are Scandinavians and we we don't uh, yeah we don't care or yeah. at least this this kind of Scandinavian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, yes, excellent. Uh, that I think looks it for Bill. And uh, as I remember, the next speaker is uh, is that so? I think. I think it is. I think it is. Oh, let's see if I can bring your talk online. Yeah, I need your help figuring out which one it is because they are all the same. <laughs> ah, excellent, excellent. Like that. Hit the width. Uh, we'll exchange the camera. Like that. Meaning that if you stand approximately here, they will be able to see you. And there you go. Yeah, so the other way along. So the laser is at the top. Excellent. Okay, so um, this is very much um, a user's perspective of using Advantage. Um, I'll talk briefly about what Advantage is um, and some examples where people, where we used it in Fusion. So pe for people who don't know, I started at STFC in January as the Neutronic Group Leader. Before that, I was working at Cullum in Fusion and um, Neutronics. Um, and so I'm going to give it an example from where we used it pretty quickly, straight after it was released, um, very successfully. Um, and then some examples of trying to use its inspiration. Um, okay, so what is it? It's developed at Oak Ridge. Um, you can get it from the NEA now or RSIC if you want. Um, it is it automates the implementation of the KDIS methodology um, or forward weighted KDIS um, if you're doing um, meshes or multiple of these things. Um, KDIS is this consistent, adjoint-driven importance sampling. Basically, it is a um, use deterministic code, in this case, de novo, which is a fairly modern deterministic code, to generate your weight windows by solving forward and joint problem. Um, and um, it's limited by the, the new, to neutrons and protons currently. Um, because that's what de novo solves. Um, the I guess KDIS has been around probably for near over ten years now. Uh, the first uh, Wagner paper was probably uh, mid two thousands, if I remember rightly. 
Um, and we've been waiting for Advantage to be released for quite some time because up until that point, if you wanted to do this method, you had to go away and write your Monte Carlo method model in one code and build an entire deterministic model of the same thing. And that you basically have to build two models. It took a lot of time. Um, and so Advantage is the automation Basically, it's, it's almost a wrapper in some respects, although it's a lot better than just a pure wrapper. Um, and um, it's extremely useful because it speeds up this problem. Now you only have to make um, one model. Um, so you generate your MCMP input um, and a very simple advantage input. The advantage input is about 20 lines. It gets longer if you have hundreds of MCMP materials because that's basically for the visualization, it gives a list of materials. But Realistically, it doesn't need much more than that. Um, and what it does, it first does some ray tracing through your model to generate a block model. Um, so you tell it what mesh you want to do, how you want to define your mesh. And that's the most important bit that you define as the user. Um, and you make a mesh model. So these things are from Joe Rismar out of four grades. I couldn't be bothered to generate a whole set of my own models to do this, so I borrowed Joe's. Um, this is actually from uh, an SNS model of Nomad um, that was presented at uh, CETIC a couple of years ago. Um, and it's using a slightly earlier version of Advantage, but the process is still the same. So it does some ray tracing through uh, the model to generate um, a blocked mesh. Um, it then solves, if you're doing forward weighted CADIS, you need to solve the forward problem. Um, so you come up with a forward mesh that's then used as a source input basically to the joint calculation. Um, this is what this you create this important source. You then solve the adjoint problem. So you solve both the forward and the adjoint using De novo, and then from that you generate weight windows that you can use in MCMP. Um, it also, if you wished it to, and generally you do, um, it will create source biasing as well um, in space and energy. Um, so for most problems, you probably you would want it. You might not necessarily always want it in installation, but it's certainly a possibility. Um, so when we use this object, um, so Jet is a Tokamak, um, largest current one in the world, um, and we were doing. Jet is aiming to do another big deuterium tritium campaign, um, and it's about twenty years since the last one. So there was a. I wish to check that the shielding hadn't degraded too much, or that nothing had changed that would have problems with shielding. So this is about 35 meters across. It's a, an MCMP turn, it's about two and a half thousand cells, something like that. So it's not a huge number of cells, but um, quite large. The walls, the bolt shield walls are about two meters thick of concrete, um, and it's got quite a complex interior geometry, um, and lots of little penetrations through the various places. So using Forward weighted, so we wanted, in this case, we're going to the mesh tally um, and we wanted to go everywhere. Um, so we wanted to get basically low results in as many places as possible outside in the areas around the Taurus Hall. We used the method that we'd previously been using, which was basically because we didn't want to build two, um, two models, one in a deterministic code and one in a on the color code, we used an iterative method which we call magic. It's basically an implementation of Cooper's method, um, slight modified uh, way of doing Cooper's method. Um, and pretty impressive compared to an analog simulation where you'd be looking to get statistics, statistics much past the top of Mac. Um, you were getting results all the way out through the building. Um, however, that took five days on 64 cores to generate that window that we then used. Advantage took 67 minutes, just over an hour, to generate a weight window that actually, if you look at the error map, um, where light blue, green is significantly better than dark blue and purple, um, you're getting a huge speed up for basically saving yourself several days worth of computational effort there. Um, so that was pretty impressive. We were, and we didn't do a lot to generate this. Um, we basically installed Advantage, which is pretty easy, uh, installed in parallel, fairly straightforward, a little bit more complicated if you want to get it running on a cluster with job submission scripts and things, but it's not too difficult. Um, and um, you know, we pretty much went for just, you have to take a bit of care about how you mesh it up, but we didn't 
think too much hard. It's pretty similar to how you'd mesh it up if you were doing reaping rules in any case. And, um, and let it go. We didn't do much in PN or SN orders, quadratures, anything like that. We just let it go on default settings. And this is pretty good, I thought. Um, similarly, if instead of doing um, wanting results everywhere, here we were looking, we had some dosimeter results throughout the labyrinth. Very complicated here. This is actually a benchmark experiment that we're trying to benchmark Monte Carlo codes on this. There is a paper out now in uh, Fusion Science on this. Um, with the synthesis made all around here. And um, again, this took over a week to generate using the previous method um, and three days to get to the same level of error, um, basically to match the experimental results, um, but with advantage. This took only sort of four hours and uh, and a lot less actual cores, only 16 cores compared to 64, and only took 10,000 CPU minutes to actually get equivalent level results. So the, the benefit is in the time it took to get results um, for us. That was, that was quite quick compared to spending a week. So I think in the end, we roughly said that this is in the region of seven days time saved to get, to get from starting to result. Um, this is again from Joel Risner. This is actually in installation. We presented this at CETA, um, but just to show you that it can be used. These are the but these are the developers using this installation um, uh, with all the insider knowledge that that entails. Um, so this was it with a geometry split, very complex model with, with a lot of geometry splitting, and you can see not particularly good statistics or so coming around the sides. Hybrid method, much smoother. Um, so very, very, you know, it's got high energy neutrons um, and very small beam running. Just to show the error maps again, you can see much better errors everywhere. Interestingly, the beam line itself seems to have kept a little bit in error. Um, so they here they don't simulate the protons onto the target. There's a derived source um, and um, and then they used, and this is probably the most important, they used uh, the Lovato quadrature um, because it has an ordinate directly along the beam axis, which is very important. Um, and um, I'll talk a bit more about this, the long history problem that you get. I mean, in any geometry system where you have a very small streaming gap and lots of thick shielding, um, if you have this potential to create very long histories, I'm not sure what happened when I just tried to do some default things uh, in a moment. Um, this one apparently took 180 CPU hours. Of course, they've got huge computing there. Um, and interestingly, their error result happened in a fifth of the time to get much better error. So again, it's all about saving computational time. You know, it was never feasibly before advantage really useful because you'd spend all of that time building the deterministic model in any case, and that was person time rather than computing time. So it's always generally easier to let the computing bit work. Weight window is pretty big, 1.8 gig. Um, it's a reasonable size for it to be reading in. Um, so it might cause issues if you're having any problems. So then I did some tests. I did lots of tests. I did some very simple shielding, you know, walls, um, casks with um, activated materials, and all of that it worked exactly as you would expect. It did really well. So I thought what would be more interesting was to show some cases where just using default things posed some questions, some, some interesting um, things to answer. So this is a very simple thermal neutron beam onto a lump of iron and looking at the photons coming off, the, the induced photons. Um, the relative error is, well, that's 0 0.059 compared to 0 0.035 in total. Actually, in each individual beam, this was an energy beams um, result. The, the energy beams, for most things, were significantly improved using advantage. So although the total didn't change hugely. What's interesting, is in the tally region it's low and in the scatter region it's low, but in between it's not. And this sort of poses some questions in my mind. How is the, you know, the old photons to get from the scatter to here have to have come through this bit in between, possibly or not? But do you really care about the answer there? Well, well photons generate in the Yeah. And then they relay, and, and really important, are we playing relay on surfaces? Yes. If they relay on surfaces and the protocol leaves, it can be relayed, so therefore you have no statistics on the travel 
So that's what it is. So that's what it is. Right? It just it, when you look at the picture, you sort of think, well, is it? and I think in some cases you would have issues where you might be a bit confused by this. But no. the other thing is, why have we got low statistics in these points? And they're basically the re effects that we're getting. We're getting a bit of re effect here um, on this particular one because you shouldn't get in particular phases. So uh, the um in, in the in the country, yeah yeah the, the boundary ice on on quotes that boundary and very very often you see that boundary really really see that boundary that are those is that what we're looking at the top and bottom of the boundaries I think so yes yeah I, I, when I, when you overlay the other so like in the the jet one yes where you overlay these sorts of if I overlay the same picture I get okay that effect so. So anyway, but I thought that was interesting because this shows that you know we would traditionally try and get the error across that region to be okay, but it's suggesting that actually we need to go up a bit. So then I tried a, a fairly simple beam line. It's just a 35 meter long small hole, fairly similar to the nomad geometry, one little sort of collimator block in a beam house, not too fancy or anything, just a nice test one. Um, and Basically, every single time I've tried to do this um, so far, I have got long histories. By long histories, I mean I tried to simulate 10,000 particles in MCMP. So that took about 12 seconds in normal. I was still going 48 hours later. Um, of course, all the cores had finished except one, and there was one long history just completely yeah, dominated. Right. And you color. Well, there are ways to cull them. Yeah. But I, I, in this case, I deliberately didn't because. Um, you know, I didn't change so on the, the car on your on your um, there are, there are, they, they form because you've got something coming all the way down here which has got a huge change in ratio uh, the weight ratio um, and so it splits and splits and splits and splits and just goes absolutely mental um, but that, so in the manual there's a whole bunch of suggestions as to how you can Resolve this various pathologies they describe. So one is that you haven't completely meshed your streaming channel correctly, and that it actually thinks there's quite a lot of material in there. So I improved the mesh up until the point where I ran out of memory on the way I was doing it, uh, without splitting up into paralyzing over uh, too much. Um, and yeah, that failed. Um, still couldn't get that. Um, it also suggests that one of the problems is in low energy neutron groups. Um, and something that I think needs to improve on the on it is that um, so you can cut off how, what energy groups in Genova you actually solve for, because then MCMP will just transport everything below that at the, the rate of the, the highest group you did. But if you also do photons, you basically the group numbering continues, so you can only cut the bottom of the photon one off. You can't cut photon and neutron bottom off. So if you're trying to, it's just something in the way it's been implemented. Um, so I'm hoping to get them to, to fix that because it would be good to cut the neutron one, not so much the photo, the bottom of the photo one. Um, there's also moving around quadrature sets, and I've tried a couple, not been too successful. I've still got to actually cheat, try the, the battle one on this. Um, so it's an interesting, more typical case, um, and basically what I think it's seeing is that just using it out of the box and following some of the guides in the manual for the sort of geometries that we're typically interested in is actually quite challenging. But I did try it on a real beam line. This is chip IR. Um, this has a completely fake 15 MeV volume source because I didn't derive a full source from it. And I still need to get the high energy um, library to transport anything above. Uh, um, but if you compare the analog to the advantage one, you get some strange effect coming around the side here because I think I've left the port open here. Um, I closed off most of them, but I, I obviously thought that one wasn't quite. Good. Yeah. 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 Especially set. Yeah. Yes. So, um, and then, but you can see it definitely transported. To, this was target based, so there's a, a tally place just in front of the beam stuff back here and just try to get results into it. Um, yeah, it was fairly successful. Oh, oops.
Um, so, um, so yeah, so it was, it was relatively successful. Again, this again required some tuning to get long histories out of the way. Um, again, this was in terms of refining the mesh and that did improve it. Um, and also in the end, I did do the uh, slight trick of just changing the rad of the C until I got it to complete as well, which is um, pretty poor, but uh, it was, it did me. So it wasn't too bad in terms of long histories. And if you change your um, dumping cycle and things like that, you can also improve this, particularly if you're doing minor works. Um, so definite improvement, but again, only a few, you know, effectively stuff gets into this part here. There's not a lot of transport. In fact, again, the error in the actual beam line is lower than the errors up back. And this is the same for what we earlier. Um, so if you were trying to do it globally, this would be different. So just to conclude, Advantage can produce very efficient weight windows in a fraction of the time if you're doing this in an iterative form. It's not a black box, like any bare introduction. It takes time to figure out how you should do it properly. You do have to understand the physics and the geometry. The manual is actually very good. It does give quite a lot of tips and examples. And on for most sort of standard geometries where you haven't like the, a shielded cask or anything like that, or um, I know it's recently been applied on the hot cells at ASS, um, perfectly being quite valid. Um, where you have the problem is where you have very strong thin channels in the, which is what you have in any weight window system. You've always had this, this particular issue with um, the strong histories. Um, I've talked to the developers, they've actually the, the developers get a thank you on the next slide. Scott uh, is the main, Scott Mosher is the main developer, Rob is the group leader, and Joel was the person who did the uh, SNS work, um, and John helped us with some of the, the stuff at Cullum. Um, but there is potential that we could do a spallation based, you know, get them to come across and do a spallation training course. You have to obviously figure out funding and things like that, but um, I know they had a little bit of funding for giving training. They've done some training for the fusion guys, um, we come across the various meetings of fusion. If we're interested, they're quite interested. So, so not, not to promise that that, uh, that this work package will uh, cover all of that, uh, we, we certainly would have resources to do that because formerly the SNS is actually not sure about on this work package, so, so we could arrange that actually. Yeah, so uh, if, if there are ways of doing that, I think they're, they're interested, we're interested. If we have enough people, then um, it certainly looks like there's to be a benefit. And as I say, for my initial tests, just using it out of the box, with, you know, reading through the manuals, seeing what they've done, um, it is possible to get quite good results. But with some expert people who've tried this a bit, we would probably be a lot more efficient in getting that information across. Okay. Excellent. So I, I had the remote request that maybe we would try to repeat some of the discussion or some of the comments made. And I know this is a bit difficult. But maybe Stuart, if you could, if you could come to the first row, I, I think we have a chance. Okay. And then I, I, I think what will will uh, will we'll spawn the discussion is going back to these uh, problem cases you you you, you discussed uh, around that one. that one, yeah, that one. around that one. So is, wasn't this where you had some uh, some questions, Eric? Maybe or wanted to hear something? I guess. So I, I asked two questions. On this, can you hear? I, I think I, I think he can, but uh, he's, 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 uh, two I can. I can hear you. Questions were: Is it not expected that you have a low, um, a large error region if you do uh, surface weight splitting because photon is generated in the ion, then it travels towards the tally area, but on exiting the ion, it is roulette game is played, so only very high weight particles, but not many travel to the tally. Then it hits the, the wall, then it gets split. So therefore, that gives you an intermediate zone, and you can. And and it's exactly what what it is. It, it initially it looks counterintuitive slightly. You know, traditionally we would expect we would try and get low error from you know you know we do this by sometimes propagating, you might move a point tally, for example, along to generate a weight window. So you'd expect to get low error in that area. But yeah, what it's basically saying is you only need to transport high weight particles 
and we only need the one, and only some of them, certain areas that interact are actually important. And so there's only some areas you actually need to get the weather. Yeah. Well, Miguel, well, Miguel is yes, uh, uh, I, uh, interjection. Uh, yes. uh, to comment on that, if I understand the, um, the workings of advanced rights, uh, it creates optimized, uh, optimized web windows for a tally. And in this case, uh, because of the location of the tally, um, it makes sense that it is not uh, paying a lot of attention to those um, to the left, top, yep. and, and bottom walls. Yes. Uh, therefore, why do you have that? If you wanted some uh, more global result, you could probably could use a, a tally that uh, covers uh, all around. Yes, yes. Around yes. the box, and you probably would get uh, everything more like like it is on the right side. Yeah. So if, if so, rather than doing target based like this, <laughs> we did forward weight. So this just used KDIS rather than forward weighted KDIS. If you used forward weighted KDIS and you were trying to optimize for that actual mesh, then it would get a very different picture. Yeah. So. Uh, my opinion that the whole reason you have uh, that high uh, relative uh, error is because it's not important for, for what you have asked the program yeah. to do. Um, while we're at it, I have another question. You, you mentioned that uh, you use the, the MCNP input. Um, is there any limitation uh, on, the, on the complexity and size of the model or some trouble you can expect if you use a complex model with nested universes or, or something, or um, yeah, I, I know if, if you I use nested universes. Yes, you deserve the pain you get. <laughs> Other than that, yes, yeah, but that, that was never my. But, but sometimes you know it's not your idea. Sometimes yeah. uh, bad things are forced upon no. you. No, the answer is no. This just basically takes your model. It actually runs MCMP and does some uh, and as well and does some ray tracing through. Um, so it. it it works out where in the mesh the various bits are. It doesn't matter. As far as I know, I've not seen, I know that, for example, the ETA model uses universes and that had no problem. Exactly, yeah. You, yeah. The limitations that I know of are to do with sources, mostly. Yeah. They're mostly do with what sources it can and cannot represent. Um, and also reflected surfaces. So if you have a model that, you, for example, you've taken a segment, um, it will then unfold that model. So if you had a torus like Eta, where you do a 40 degree sector, they then unfold that model and that's worked successfully, but there are only certain, and I can't remember which way around it is, um, plane type, uh, reflective planes or boundary conditions mm -hmm. that it currently accepts. The next one, um, the next edition, which is due out sort of first quarter next year, um, should have a few more of these boundary conditions accepted. Uh -huh. um, it will also support cylindrical mesh tallies and the other one that currently causes quite a few people issues is um, if you have a cell rejection source Sorry. with multiple cells to be rejected, um, it can it, it's not so happy. Um, and, and I think the other thing on sources that it currently can't do is if you have multiple um, distribution, multiple continuous distributions. Um, so if you use um, ah. um, Maxwellian distribution plus uh -huh. a, for the energy plus another distribution, continuous distribution uh, in a different area or something like that, um, um, that would be a problem. But you can do you can discretize it. Uh -huh. so. Yeah, and, the, and so. I guess it doesn't support uh, user defined uh, sources. Uh, or, or maybe no. No. you were telling you so. That, that's definitely not something that, as okay. far as I know, the, what they've done for the SNS one is that you derive a source that you can then put into your derive a neutron source effectively at a certain point, which is something you definitely want to do. Can I just remind you, this is a very introduction. If your real source is in source, it's something directly in itself, but you can approximate, it's great. Yeah. This is not with the yeah. balance switch, it's not the result. Yeah, which is what I did on that. Um, I've, I've been trying with the chip IR one, for example, generating the various reduction in completely the wrong, you know, in just a few energy groups, one above 10, what, you know, because we found previously when doing the magic system that you basically needed a high energy, an intermediate energy, and a low energy group, and that's pretty much all you need for your windows to be reasonable. You didn't need to get, you didn't need to do every nuance of your strategy, you just needed to be fairly, fairly covering what you were interested in. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's possible. 
question. So, uh, so while while we uh, we had uh, this discussion here, uh, there was a bit of <laughs> a bit of an offline uh, or yeah, well, online discussion uh, in parallel. Um, so there was a question from uh, Esben Klinkby. Uh, uh, if anyone knew, uh, uh, so he, he knew that uh, Advantage works uh, well with MCMT5, and if anyone. Uh, no, if there are efforts to make it work with MCMPX, uh, Constantine, Batcar, Fast, the same for MCMP6. And Eric Iverson uh, said that uh, they've been able to use Advantage with uh, both uh, MCMPX and MCMP6, yes, right. uh, so this long as MCMP5 MCMP is also installed on the system, yeah. uh, because okay. this is used to set up the de novo problem. Yeah, so as long as you've got MCMP5 on your system, uh, I used uh, 6 to generate most of these, and I used X for one of the other. Of one of the simulations. So yeah, if yeah. you can read the way window, all you're doing is using it to generate a yeah. window. Right. Right. Six, six, six is good. Okay. Yeah. The only problem is if you're using um, five, you have the limitations of five, so yeah. you can't. You know, but then the, those limitations are pretty much repeated into the Yeah, yeah. And this was essentially neutron, photon transport. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a deterministic code. So yeah, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, it's pretty good for deterministic code, I have to say, compared to like DOT and TORT, which was a little bit predecessor. It's quite a big step forward. If yeah. it okay, interesting stuff. I, I think we should aim at, at having having people uh, come over and talk to us about this this postulation. I think that will make a lot of sense. Yes. Okay. So, uh, any further question from? Uh, or from uh, the remote sites, I guess not. Then, uh, then, then, Stuart, I think you're actually up. <laughs> so, let's see. Yeah, something like that. Um, well, <laughs> it's it, it'll it'll be launch time then, of course. But uh, uh, that's so that's you, which I'm, one? Is I'm your... just a simple sign. Oh, that's true. That's true. This was because I couldn't possibly come up with a no, name. No, no, that's that's just good. It's, it's a name. It's a name. Um, this ought to work. Basic point that it's up. Everyone's left and right. Okay. Everyone, hear me offline, online, hopefully. Um, I'm going to talk uh, today about um, Comla and not. Comlair itself, particularly, but how to build a whole beamline, because that's really what we want to do. We want to simulate a beamline, protons on target, and we want to go to um, the, the beam stop or source. And um, I'm clicking with the mouse. And so I'm going to try and get. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yay, happiness. The first most important thing to remember is just how awful we are, all of us. Uh, this is. Um, uh, a reflector moderator system. This is a beam line. They are immensely complicated, real world. Really, really, really complicated. Yet what we simulate is a pile of rubbish. It is the most simple rubbish model on the planet. And this is not because we choose to. It's because we can't model the complex stuff. So much effort is, is put in to model this stuff that we don't put all the fancy pipes all the magnets, all the cables, all the vacuum tubes, all the stuff that actually turns out to get really active. So obviously plays quite an important part in the, the problem. Uh, no, this one. Right, yay. Yeah. But why? Well, half the problem is MCMPX, which is nothing short of a nightmare. I will not use any other words. Every volume needs to be described in individual quadratics. You have to completely describe the volume. Surfaces like toruses are a pile of rubbish in MCMPX standard. Almost everybody I know puts them in so they can go on a general access. Um, and the code, when you look at it, is assembly language. There is nothing else that describes it. In fact, assembly language, when I used to write that as a kid, is much more readable than this. <laughs> and everything, absolutely everything, the guys put into MCMPX to help you make models hurts you so badly that anybody using them is crazy. So complementary cells get rid of them. Universe is a joke because they just slow everything down so much. Transform cards, they're singlet. They have um, gimbal lock. They don't implement full algebra, full geometric algebra. Macrobodies are just a mess that slowly code down, and there's no Boolean invariances. 
All of that, I have no idea why it's there. What we want is, is something like this. This is Tom Lair, by the way. I'm not going to show you pictures from something else. That's a Tom Lair picture of, of objects. What we want to do is hijack the McStass idea. McStass does this really well. Here's a chopper. Everything about the chopper's there. We don't have to think. There's a chopper. I want chopper housing. I want windows for the beam. I want motors. I want uh, nuts, bolts, screws. This chopper assembly's got nearly about 1,300 components, something like that. And I want to put them down one after another because the SS for whatever it is um, seems to think that every beam line needs 400 choppers. I mean, I, I, no, I'm not joking. The worst beam line has 12 chopper assemblies. This is crazy. And if you want to model them individually, you will die. So this is um, a little bit, not all of, um, prior, sorry, I have to remember. And it's on a slope, it goes down, it has multiple choppers, and this is only 11 meter section. You see one, two, three, four, five choppers, polymer units and some other things in there, and things complicated. What you need to do that, to even keep track, is to have a toolbox. And so we need a toolbox. Um, and we need the following things that do not come from MCM here. When we have an output of an MCM PX file, it has to be good to run. No failures, no problems, no possibilities, no lost particles, nothing. I want it to either be good or bad. That's the statement. If it is bad, I want to know now before I even start running it. I want to be able to look at it so I can see what my problem is, but I want to know this is not a good file. I want to stop the stupidity of calling surfaces by numbers. I do not want to call materials by numbers because you'll make mistakes. If you have material 38 in tungsten, oh no, we have typed it wrong and it's 39 and you've got water or something. How many people have wrecked models like that? You do not make a mistake when you write water. Yeah, you might get the wrong temperature a little bit when you write water 300 or water 270, but it's not a drastic error. You, you will not make a mistake when you write tungsten. You, you're not going to get water. <laughs> And I want the whole system to deal with the tally and the variance reduction all in one go. I don't want to think I want a default variance reduction that's probably good enough, because actually most of the time it's not. So how are we going to do this? The first thing is we want to be McStass. Seriously, that's probably a big compliment for McStass. I want to be McStass, but I want to do this in a proper three-dimensional world where things overlap. And that means I have to make some changes to how I think. And the first thing is I want to decouple the idea of how I assemble things, or where I assemble things, and how they overlap. And I want them completely decoupled from my mental thinking. So first we're going to talk about how to put things in space, where things need to be, what orientations they need to be, and, and so on. And that's simply the ComLab principle. We are going to define everything is going to be a fixed component or some derivation of that, so a group of fixed components. So let's talk about a chopper house. It is a fixed component. That means it has an origin. It has a proper origin somewhere in space. It's an object that so has actually a name. So it could be the dream chopper 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, P, whatever you want to call it. And so we can have many chopper houses, but we only have one name for this chopper house that we have. So it has an origin and axis. The next thing is it can have lots of things in it. It can be made of lots of things. I don't care what those things are. And each one of those is referenced relative to its axis and origin, both axis and origin. You rotate this object and all these things come with it. That's good. So, but it now does something else, and it's important. It has an export system for exporting not just its axis and origin. That's not enough but it can export another of link points, another surface map, the outside boundaries, and points on that boundary. So you can export those points somewhere else. Take a chopper housing. You might want to connect a beam line to the lower port. You need motor to the motor axis. You need, I don't know, lifting hooks, perhaps, or an assembly at the bottom. So you need a multiple set, any number you like, of these export link points. Uh, that one. Okay, so what do you do with this? What we're going to do, and we'll talk about insertion in a minute, you throw things in and you start building beam lines. So when you build a beam line, when you're thinking about a beam line, you build it as a straight line. 
You don't have to worry about the axis, the rotations, the fact there's a bender. It doesn't matter. None of this matters any longer. You just build the whole beam line straight, even the bent ones, because you just take the link point to the end of the bender, and now we just carry straight on. Everything can get built. This is a, 